Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Endowment for Middle East Truth's weekly webinar featuring Middle East expert Jonathan Spire. I want to thank you all for joining us, supporting the work that Emmett does at these very perilous times for the state of Israel and world jewelry. And our work is more important than ever. Um, so please consider sponsoring one of our webinars, making a contribution to our important work, and uh, sharing this information with your, with your networks. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be available for viewing and sharing. If you have any questions for Jonathan, you can place them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Please limit your entries to questions only. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Jonathan Spire is a director of research at the Middle East Forum and director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis. He is author of two books, Days of the Fall, A Reporter's Journey in the Syria and Iraq Wars, and The Transforming Fire, The Rise of the Israel-Islamist Conflict. Although I believe this is the first time we're hosting Jonathan on an Emmett webinar, I've followed his work for years and I urge you all to do the same. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, when I was in Israel with the Middle East Forum, we met with many government officials. And while the focus of our discussions began with Hamas war, my questions to everyone I met with was, what about Iran? Don't we have to deal with the serpent and cut its head off? Um, you know, it doesn't matter how many Iranian surrogates that are ultimately destroyed, they'll just pop up with, with new ones and train and support and, and fund them. Um, so I, I actually like the terms that you've used in, a re in your recent report that we're going to be focusing on, and we're going to put the link into the chat box for everybody, because I think the report is very much worth everybody's time to take a look at. Um, you recognize that the focus on the proxies may be treating the symptoms, but it ignores the disease itself. And you recently wrote, quote, Tehran's goal is clear. It is not solely regional hegemony. Iran wishes to replace the post-Cold War US-led security architecture in the region with a nexus dominated by itself alongside other anti-Western forces, especially Russia and China. Um, I'd also argue that this is the direct result of Obama's policy of realignment, and we've had multiple webinars where we've um, talked about that. So if the US's goal under Team Obama Biden is to basically empower Iran, should we be surprised that Iran has built up an army of proxies and we've just sat idly by doing nothing and, and, and haven't prevented this growth? And do you believe it's a function of U.S. naivete, believing that if it leaves the region, if the U.S. leaves the region, it will be left alone by the terrorists uh, on our own soil? And also, is it a callous disregard for Israel's survival, being left to fight on the front lines alone? Thanks for the uh, those questions, Laurie. Yeah, uh, first of all, with regards to the issue of concentrating on the proxies versus concentrating on Iran itself, on the head of the snake or head of the octopus or whatever zoological metaphor we're going for today. Um, my answer is that, you know, we have to concentrate on both. In other words, it's not either or uh, any more than, you know, when people would ask, should we be focusing on the Iranian nuclear file or on the Iranian use of proxies in a bid for regional domination? And the answer is no, we need to focus on both because both are absolutely essential. In other words, of course, we have to challenge Hamas. We have to have uh, good deterrence against Hamas and we failed to have that. Uh, and we paid with what took place on October 7th. We have to, you know, be properly arranged regarding Hezbollah in Lebanon. But, you know, we can't focus solely on the proxies. At the end of the day, the proxies cannot be defeated strategically, in my view, and finally, without also taking on the Islamic Republic of Iran itself. And was the war will end, so to speak, when the Islamic when when the Islamic Republic of Iran regime falls, and it won't really end before that. Before that, we're uh, fighting battles, and of course, we have to fight battles, and we have to fight them well, and we have to win them. But we understand that you know, at the end of the day, the uh, the real war is against Islamic Republic of Iran uh, itself. Now, with regard to uh, the issue of what well, you were talking about, United States policy and strategy and who to blame for this situation, first of all, I think we should be careful not to blame ourselves too much. That's to say, at the end of the day, you know, who is responsible for what has taken place in the region? I mean, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, among the Palestinians, uh, which we're discussing today, is Iran itself. You know, there is a there is a state with very considerable capacities and abilities that has set itself a strategic goal of profound change in the region in the regional balance of power in which it comes to be uh, dominant that's a very serious project and it is pursuing it and it is not pursuing it in reaction to something that we in the west have done it's not that you know we've upset them or we've been too tough with them or too soft with them this is a project that has its own 
uh, integrity, so to speak. It comes from deep within the particular culture and ideology of which those people are operating according uh, to. Uh, having said that, of course, the, the question does arise, well, yeah, okay, but what's an effective response to that? Um, obviously, I'm not an, a US citizen, so it's, to some degree, it's not really my place, nor do I wish to kind of start uh, assigning grades to this or that US administration. You know, I'm sitting here in Israel and the United States is our most uh, valued and powerful and important ally. And that's the case regardless of who's in the White House. But having said that, you know, purely from the point of view of analysis of the region, I think it's possible to point out errors that have been, uh, that are attributable to a number of administrations. Without, without question, the Obama administration uh, had a deeply flawed uh, uh, perspective on Iran and on the Middle East region itself. Uh, it is, I think, beyond question that the Obama administration wished to appease Iran, wished to uh, incentivize Iran, believed that by incentivizing and appeasing Iran, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran could be turned into a normal actor in the region. This, I think, is indisputable. There are those within our sort of policy analyst community who go further than that and say, no, actually, what Obama wanted was to make Iran into an ally. He wanted to ally with Iran against America's traditional uh, allies, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and so on. This, to me, is uh, the verdict for me on that is not proven. I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm saying I don't think that the people who promote it produce sufficient evidence for proving that it's that rather than naivete and an inability to correctly analyze the region. Without any question, appeasement and the desire to uh, to make Iran into a normal actor underlay Obama's Iran policy, underlay the JCPOA and all that derived from it, but also was part of a much broader naivete of that administration. Let's remind ourselves, Obama didn't only seek to appease Iran. He was happy to see the Muslim Brotherhood come to power also in Egypt and other Arab countries in the belief that apparently they would be normal actors too. It was all vastly, uh, deeply in error. We've all paid a price for that. Uh, and the price maybe is still not yet uh, completely uh, paid. Having said that, you know, let us not forget other administrations, if we're going to talk about political history, are worth bearing in mind. Had it not been for the US and coalition invasion of Iraq, for example, uh, the Iranian push towards domination in the region would be in a much more difficult place. I say if Iraq was still in the hands of a Sunni dictator, frankly, uh, then the Iranians would have a kind of very strong wall standing against them. So actually, it's, it's fair to say, I think, you know, in retrospect, that the Bush, second Bush administration's invasion of Iraq ended up handing Iraq to Iran. So blame, you know, there's plenty of blame. It, it's, there's plenty to go around. It's not all just in the hands of one administration, uh, I would say. Um, so that's, I think, where we are in terms of, uh, you know, how we got to sort of to this current situation. Um, of course, there was the Trump administration also, which uh, left the JCPOA. Um, and there are different views on both sides uh, as to whether that was wise or not. My own view is that I was a backer of the notion of the maximum pressure strategy. And I'm personally, from my point of view, sorry that it was abandoned and that it was abandoned in a sense with Biden then put into reverse. And we go back to essentially Obama administration too, you know, where basically once again, it's all about incentivizing Iran. It's all about getting billions of dollars that are currently frozen, you know, from in South Korea or in Iraq and helping the Iranians get their hands back on them again with the notion of turning them into a normal actor again. That's all catastrophic in my view and, and hugely uh, uh, bound to fail. And I'm, it, it's, frustrating, I guess, for me as an observer and also as a resident of the region to see that maximum pressure only kind of had four years and therefore wasn't able to really realize itself. I do think that at the end of the day, we'll go back to maximum pressure of one kind or another, uh, unless we want to just allow Iran to continue, you know, rolling across the region and, uh, and laying waste to all before it. So that's my view. We will eventually have to go back to maximum pressure. And it will be, in my view, not only diplomatic maximum pressure, but very possibly other means also needing to be employed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hope you're right about that because I certainly agree that it, I, I thought that it was it was working. Um, it was disappointing. And, and even post 10-7, Biden has issued um, sanctions waivers to Iran, which is, I think, surprising. So let's get to, uh, let's, let's turn to and spend a few minutes talking about Iran's role 
or influence in the Hamas invasion on 10-7. Do we have mm -hmm. evidence that it played a direct role in planning, funding, and training the terrorists or in greenlighting the attack at least? And does Iran look at Hamas as being expendable, unlike Hezbollah, which we'll talk about in a bit? Mm. Um, you know, do you think that Iran and, and Hamas were taken aback by the extent of Israel's retaliation and determination to once and for all rid Gaza of the terrorist enterprise? Um, you know, what were some of Iran's calculations, perhaps, to the extent that you can, you know, give yeah. Us well, look, there's, you know, there's plenty of stuff available in terms of, you know, openly available in terms of Iranian support for Hamas and the Iranian relationship with Hamas over the years. So, I mean, in terms of your, your first question about arming and training and, and and thereby facilitating the possibility of the attack, I don't think there's any, any question. You know, Iran absolutely, since the mid-1990s, has been a very major backer of Hamas to the tune of tens of millions of dollars per year, but also in terms of providing the capacity for Hamas to uh, prepare and train. For example, uh, the uh, homemade uh, domestic, so to speak, uh, rocket capacity that Hamas has, the ability to build rockets inside Gaza, is a direct result of the relationship with Iran. It was the Iranians who taught Hamas how to do that. Uh, and that goes also for uh, tactical military training, but also for provision of weaponry. Without any question, in, in this sense, without any question, Iran uh, is a, a facilitator of uh, of October 7th. Um, as we know, there was a, a sort of a hiccup, so to speak, in the Iranian Hamas relationship during the period of the Arab Spring, because uh, that time Hamas, which of course is a Sunni movement deriving from a Muslim Brotherhood type ideology, at that time Hamas, as, as many others did too, thought that a kind of new Muslim Brotherhood led block was going to be born in the region, you know, with the brothers in power in Egypt and in Tunisia and in a certain sense in Turkey as well, with plenty of money coming from Qatar. So they kind of jumped ship. If you remember, in 2011, they removed their headquarters from uh, Damascus and they tried very hard to join that Muslim Brotherhood-led bloc. That Muslim Brotherhood-led bloc, of course, ended up not coming into being at all. Uh, the key moment in its reverse was, of course, the military coup in Egypt in July of, uh, of uh, 2013. Um, and so Hamas had to try to get back into Iran's good graces, so to speak. And that took a little while. That was something which we were watching very carefully because the Iranians were not you know, trusting and they were disappointed and they were they were angry and uh, Hamas had to make a, an effort. But certainly by you know, 2018, 2019, that essentially has been achieved. The re relationship has been repaired. The relationship is close once again. We see the close cooperation. So. Yes, in terms of training, in terms of funding, without a doubt, the Iranians stand behind this. In terms of precise planning and timing, it's a more complex and difficult question. The sense that many of us in the course of 2023, and many of us wrote about this as well, had the sense that something weird was going on and that something was brewing. And, you know, many people wrote about that, and I'm one of them, didn't foresee or predict that precise timing or place, but a lot of people thought, and one of the reasons why we thought that was because there was a series, you'll probably remember, there was this series of meetings taking place also in Beirut and elsewhere, where senior figures from Hamas, from Hezbollah, from the uh, Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps would, would gather and would, would meet. And there was a sense of, well, why? What's going on here? What's being planned here? What's uh, what's happening? So there was a sense that something was, was, building, was building up. And I think that from that point of view, it's very likely that Iran knew that something was being planned and that it would go off at a particular time. The starting gun would sound, so to speak, at a particular time. As to whether the Iranians knew the exact time or the exact dimensions of the uh, attacks of October 7th, again, I would say it's not proven. I think anybody who would say categorically, yes, they did, or no, they didn't, is probably getting a bit uh, ahead of themselves, you know, because I don't think we really know uh, yet. I think there is some evidence to suggest that the Iranians were not happy necessarily with the uh, dimensions of the attack or nature of the attack or timing of the attack. I think the proof is located, or maybe proof too strong a word, but the indication uh, is located in the fact that contrary apparently to the hopes of the uh, Gaza Hamas leader Sinwar, Yahya Sinwar, the Iranians have not fully mobilized all their proxies into you know, the big war against to, to try to destroy Israel. That hasn't happened. Actually, what we've seen is a tentative and partial mobilization of Iran's proxies. 
And to a great extent, I think what we can see is that Iran is mobilizing because it understands it has to do something on behalf of its junior client, uh, Hamas, but it doesn't want to risk the really important assets that it has in order to try to save Hamas, which would appear to me to indicate that there may not have been you know, coordination with regard to the exact timing and the exact nature of the attack which took uh, place. In terms of the uh, Iranian side being surprised by the extent of Israel's response, uh, the answer is yes. I think that there is uh, considerable evidence for this, and you can find it in some pro-Iran media as well and in discussion. Yeah, the um, it is one of the characteristics of the pro-Iran uh, alliance, which I think listeners and, and you certainly are, are very much aware of, which is that it tends to uh, underestimate its enemy, that is to say Israel, that is to say ourselves. You know, I think we should also, with all due humility, say that we make a tendency to do that as well. So we should also watch ourselves and not only be criticizing others. We also certainly may have a tendency to complacency and to underestimate the enemy. But they sure have that delusion too. In other words, look, you follow their media, you follow their uh, statements, and, you know, it's all along the lines of Hassan Nasrallah's famous uh, speech where he said in, in Binge Bell uh, in 2000, where he said that Israel's weaker than a spider's web. People are probably familiar with that. That's the kind of language they use about Israel. So, yes, they do tend to underestimate Israel. Specifically, what they underestimate is Israel's will to fight and will to win. They know that Israel is technically very strong and, in fact, much stronger than them. Nobody can deny that. What they tend to say, though, is, yes, Israel has all these planes and tanks and high tech and so on. But what they don't have is the ability to actually fight and hold on and push forward. So for this reason, I think they have been surprised, firstly, by the ground uh, operation into Gaza itself, let's say from October 27th onward, but also by the extent of it, the depth of it, the tenacity of it, the determination of it, and the very uh, uh, serious goals that Israel set itself and is seriously pursuing, namely the goal of destroying the Hamas political authority in Gaza in its totality. I think yes, they were surprised by that because I think they they had a, they had mis uh, they had mis uh, uh, defined Israel to themselves. They thought that Israel was a much weaker and more hesitant society with much less self belief uh, than, as it turns out, it actually has. So yeah, in that sense, I think they have been surprised. Now you asked also about the issue of is Hamas expendable, and that's a really central question, and especially now, you know in the uh, aftermath of the uh, assassination of General Mohammad Reza uh, Zahedi, you know, which took place just yesterday, apparently by Israel, a senior revolutionary guards figure uh, in Syria. The uh, issue of is Hamas expendable is now very pertinent because, of course, that ge the general, the General uh, Zahedi, was killed as part of Iran's, as a response to Iran's partial escalation in support of Hamas. And now Iran is really faced with a very uh, important question. Is Hamas expendable? That is to say, does Iran now basically just, uh, you know, put down the, the killing of this general to necessary costs and say, nevertheless, the need to not respond totally because we've got really important assets that we don't want to risk in order to enter into a round of fighting to support Hamas. Do they stay with that view? Or do they now say, well, no, because now... Yeah, even if before we might have not wanted to rush in, you know, 100% behind Hamas, now that a very senior general, a senior IIGC figure has been killed by Israel, apparently, inside Syria, we have to respond, even if it means a deterioration to the total type of war, which they clearly have been trying to avoid since October. So, yeah, that issue of is Hamas expendable or not is very, very pertinent uh, at the present time. My own sense is that the Iranians will have to respond to uh, killing of uh, General Zahedi uh, in a way which they've not responded uh, before. I mean, in the course of this this war, because he was a pretty senior and significant figure, by far the most senior Revolutionary Guards figure uh, to be killed so far. Of course, they're saying he was killed also in an Iranian uh, diplomatic facility. And to them, there's the question of sovereignty and so on. So I think they probably will have to hit back in that way. But so maybe Hamas isn't totally expendable because then Hamas may well lead to a situation of, you know, through its earlier actions of major confrontation between Iran and Israel. But I do think that, yeah, 
it's worthwhile bearing in mind that Hamas has a much more junior place in the Iranian proxy constellation, if I can use that phrase, than, for example, Lebanese Hezbollah does. It's a very different type of uh, relationship also. In some ways, the Hamas uh, connection to Iran uh, is similar to that of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, maybe even of the Houthis as well, uh, in the sense that these are more client, patron relationships rather than proxy relationships. That's to say uh, Hamas and the Houthis also were uh, and are independent movements with uh, authentic, I guess, local contexts. They emerge from a real local context, the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, in uh, Hamas's case, of course, or the Zaidi Shia context in Yemen in, for the Houthis. Whereas uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, for example, or the Qatayb Hezbollah organization in Iraq, as another example, these are not movements that found their way to Iran and to the Revolutionary Guards Corps. These are movements that the Revolutionary Guards Corps created and established. You know, their logos, their flags, their very uh, rhetoric is the same, ideology is the same as that of the Revolutionary Guards. So it's a much closer uh, and less transactional relationship, I would say, in the case of movement organizations like Hezbollah or type Hezbollah when compared to Hamas. So there is, we do always have to be aware of that distinction. And it does mean, yeah, I think that the Iranians will relate differently to Hamas. Let me put it this way very plainly. Uh, my view is that the uh, Hezbollah, the Lebanese Hezbollah missile capacity, missile and rocket capacity, is of absolutely cardinal importance to the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's put it there, and, and you know, we, 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 many analysts say this, it's put it there uh, for the moment when Israel might choose to uh, hit Iranian nuclear facilities. That's what that missile array is there for. So it's for a strategic uh, purpose of the very highest order from Islamic Republic of Iran's point of view. And yeah, I don't want to say that Hamas is completely expendable to them, but it's certainly, you know, several degrees below that level of importance for Iran. So Iran has to consider, do I want to risk the possibility of this missile array being destroyed before it's had a chance to be used for what we wanted to use it for when we've spent, you know, 40 years building it up in order to protect Hamas, an ally of a secondary order? Well, maybe so and maybe not. That, I think, is what the, is the dilemma which the Iranians are currently faced with. So, so let's talk a little bit more about the Hezbollah threat. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it was my hope that Israel would have launched a preemptive strike on Hezbollah after October 7th, but the Biden administration yeah. apparently put the kibosh on that. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, living through this, the situation in the north is awful. There's 60,000 Israelis displaced. There's missile attacks daily. Um, it seems that there, the escalation is, is getting a little worse. Um, and in effect, there's now a, a buffer zone in Israeli territory di diminishing the size of Israel. Um, I know mm -hmm. you believe that Iran must be dealt with, but you also wrote a column entitled Israel must preempt Hezbollah in which you wrote, quote, um, once diplomatic efforts fail, as they surely will, then Israel will face the choice of acquiescing to the steady erosion of the possibility of normal life for the citizens of its northern communities or acting decisively to reverse this trend. You concluded, a large-scale Israeli military campaign to destroy or severely degrade Lebanese Hezbollah must therefore be launched. So do you see this campaign as a necessary step on the way to behead the snake? Do you believe that Israel, the Israeli government, as it currently stands, and the public will support such a step, um, which obviously, is, we all know, will be quite different than the Gaza war? And mm. uh, you know, what type of role will Iran play in Israeli Hezbollah war? Um, and as you point out, it's worked very hard to build up this Shia crescent across Iraq, Syria, and into Lebanon. Yeah, first of all, the, the, the first question you asked was, do I think it's necessary? And the answer is, yeah, I do. I think it's of cardinal uh, strategic importance to Israel's future that uh, Israel must act and soon to deal a crippling blow to Hezbollah. And when I say Lebanese Hezbollah, and when I say crippling blow, I, I don't just mean pushing the Radwan force, you know, five kilometers back uh, from the border. Uh, I don't even mean uh, pushing the Radwan force and the other forces all the way north of the Latani. That's not sufficient either. Uh, Israel has to do that, but it has to also deal with the missile and rocket uh, array, which can be launched 
from north of the Litani. You know, it doesn't make that much difference to be north of the Litani if you have, you know, M600 missiles that can reach all the way down to central Israel. So that's the threat cardinally, which I think Israel has to deal with. And I think that this is an opportunity to do so, especially when we have a situation, as you correctly pointed out, where, you know, we have an unresolved situation in which 60,000 Israelis, or over 60,000 Israelis have left their homes. Israel's north to the tune of, you know, the, the entire radius of the border, five kilo and to a depth of five kilometers, is basically uh, deserted. This is something which is unprecedented in uh, the history of, not only of the state of Israel, but of the modern history of Jewish uh, residence and settlement in, in the land of Israel. Let's say all the way back to pre-state days, with the exception of, in 1920, when Israel temporarily, or when the Yishuv, you know, the, the Jewish presence in Israel, uh, temporarily found it necessary to to evacuate four communities, Tel Chai and Kfal Giladi and uh, Metula and one other. Uh, you know, that was, in 1920, regarded as a moment of supreme uh, difficulty for the Zionist movement. Now, the notion of abandoning Jewish communities, and, you know, to the extent that Tel Chai and the defense of Tel Chai and so on remains a very important motif in Israeli history, the idea that, you know, we're not leaving Tel Chai and we're staying there in, in, in the north. Well, right now, you know, we've abandoned, you know, the entirety of the north. And as you correctly point out, Hezbollah has, in effect, established a security zone on the Israeli side of the border. We should bear in mind that Israel has, if we're going to use that comparison, we should note that, you know, Israel has also established a security zone on Hezbollah's side of the border, in the sense that around 100,000 Lebanese in the south have also left their homes. So, you know, but nevertheless, that's not. this is not, of course, an acceptable situation. And currently speaking, at least, there is no diplomatic way of resolving it. Uh, for as long, at least, as the fighting in Gaza goes on, Hezbollah will continue to attack and people will not be able to go to their homes. But my own sense is that it should, the, when the Gaza war does end, if Hezbollah then says, well, OK, fine, we're just stopping shooting now and you can all go back to uh, the status quo ante bellum on the border, so to speak. Yeah, it's just not feasible because Israelis, you know, I know you've been up there as well. I and mean, if you go to someone like Kibbutz Metula, for as one example, you will see that Israelis prior to October 8th, when Hezbollah began its uh, barrage in the north, uh, people, Israelis were living literally meters away from where Hezbollah fighters were conducting activities on the other side of the border fence. You know, in the pre-October 7th, 2023 world, so to speak, that was apparently imaginable. Uh, I don't think it is imaginable in the post-October 7th, 2023 world, which will be the world we'll be in even when the guns in Gaza stop firing, which means that we'll then be faced with the question of are we prepared to effectively seed the northern border area of our country as a result of terror and blackmail on the part of Lebanese Hezbollah with Islamic Republic of Iran behind it, or are we not? I sincerely hope that the answer will be that we are not prepared to. If we're not prepared to, there isn't going to be Amos Hochstein and diplomacy to reach an agreement because Hezbollah are never going to agree, Not, of course not to the missile issue, but they're never going to agree even to redeploy five kilometers north. Even the minimum demand that would get them you know, away from the uh, you know the kids' bedrooms, so to speak, in Kibbutz Metula, yeah, the way from the houses and the, the uh, you know the kindergartens of Kibbutz Metula, even that they won't agree to, let alone anything more. And as I've already said, I think we need to ask for a great deal more than that, which means that we are basically faced with the issue of either we deal with Lebanese Hezbollah militarily or we effectively cede the northern border to it as a result of threats and terror. I think it is. That's why I began with saying it's a matter of strategic importance. Uh, it's even, you know, even potentially historical importance in the sense that to cede a situation like that, to concede to a situation like that would be a potentially mortal blow, you know, to the whole, to my view, the whole project of building Jewish uh, sovereignty in the land of Israel. It's, it's that important. We're at that watershed moment, in my estimation, at least. And that's why I think, yes, it is necessary for Israel to preempt uh, in order to uh, prevent that situation and in order to uh, deal with the Hezbollah threat. Now, will there be sufficient support for this and, and will there be political will? Uh, the answer is, of course, I don't, I don't, I can't really know. I do think that in the in the person of the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, and the people around him, uh, there is support for this. I think this is what they want to do.
But Gallant, of course, doesn't rule by himself. Um, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, history with regard to the use of the big army is a little bit different. Netanyahu has always been very cautious about large scale, about ordering large scale military actions. In fact, he he doesn't really have a history of you know preemptive military action of in, involving the big army, so to speak. Netanyahu likes to use the air force. He likes to use the special forces. Those are the things he's comfortable with. But you can't do this just with the Air Force and the Special Forces. You need the whole, you, you'll need several divisions, of course, to do it uh, effectively. So I have a bit more of a question mark as to whether Prime Minister Netanyahu will, will back it. And regarding taking the temperature of the society, it's difficult because, yeah, you know, it will be difficult. It would be difficult to say to Israelis, you know, okay, actually, it's time for another round now and a potentially bigger one. Yeah, I, I won't deny that I, that's, that would be a very, very hard sell to many, many people in this country. Uh, it's possible that we won't get to the point of having to decide it or not, because Hezbollah slash the Iranians will make the decision for us by their own uh, by their own actions. Uh, that it may well be, if I was to, if I'm able to, if I dare to kind of predict that if this does end up happening, it may well end up happening because the enemy delivers a kind of fait accompli to us, which we then just have no choice but to respond to. And then we respond to it very vigorously. That may well be how this stuff will end up happening. But whether it happens or not, I can only say as an, as an analyst and as an observer and as a citizen and resident of Israel, that I regard it as a matter of, uh, uh, of, of strategic imperative that Israel should act to deal with the Hezbollah threat in the North. In short, one more sentence on this, just to say the following. I mean, if October 7th and what took place in the days following that proves anything at all, it is that the notion, which we'd kind of been tacitly living under for about a decade and a half prior to October 7th, even though it was never really properly discussed politically or, or on a uh, strategic level, uh, you know, was we would kind of collectively decided that uh, it was OK to have Islamist armies build up on our borders. That was a level of risk which we could live with. Uh, because we thought we'd be uh, smart enough to, and strong enough to deter them or smart enough to know when they were planning something. Yeah, that is a model and a level of risk, which I think ended forever on October 7th, 2023. I certainly think it should have ended forever then. So if that model has now been discredited, then we have to build another one. We can't just build it in the south. We have to build it in the north as well. What applies to Hamas must surely apply to Lebanese Hezbollah also, especially considering the fact that it is, of course, a vastly stronger and more consequential uh, organization than is Hamas. So so you bring up, let, let's turn to the West Bank because um, there's threats on, on Israel's eastern border as well. And um, that brings in Jordan. Protests are escalating in Jordan, which has been standing with Hamas. Um, and I've read that Iraqi militias have threatened to arm Jordanians to attack uh, you know, for attacks against Israel. And then there was this rumor that Hezbollah brigades are, are threatening to, to send yeah. in, you know, 12,000 or train 12,000 Jordanians. Um, does Khamenei have his sights next on Jordan? And what is the threat from Jordan about which Israel, America and the Gulf states should be seriously concerned? Yeah, I think there's two sides to this with regard to the issues of concern coming out of, uh, of Jordan. And, and you kind of also noted them in the sense that on the one hand, there's the issue of domestic unrest taking place inside Jordan, Jordanian citizens uh, demonstrating on behalf of Hamas. And this is something which we're already seeing, of course, in Jordan. There's been very furious and angry demonstrations. Then we've heard statements from Hamas leadership over the last 48 hours encouraging that and making some pretty incendiary statements regarding what they'd like to to happen inside Jordan. But let's remember, I mean, Jordan is, of course, a majority Palestinian uh, society or country, uh, and it is a country which almost certainly, were there to be actually free elections uh, held, would elect uh, a Muslim Brotherhood government. So, you know, as to whether the Jordanian public are strongly in support of Hamas and of what's taking place currently west of the Jordan River, I think we can safely conclude that they are. Having said that, in the past, at least, the uh, strength of Jordanian security forces the Jordanian interest, not sentiment. And when it comes to sentiment, we know exactly where the sentiment apparently of the Queen of Jordan and probably the King too uh, is located. When it comes to their self-interest, they know they need to stick closely to the West and to the United States 
and to Israel. So when it comes to their ability to defend themselves and their understanding that they need to, those things have tended to stay intact. Um, of course, nobody can predict uh, revolutions. Nobody can predict how a set of protests will go. But certainly at the present level, I don't think we're seeing from within Jordan anything that's coming remotely close to threatening the existence of the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan, so to speak. So I think that's something to keep one's eye on, certainly. But I don't think it's there you know, at a moment of sort of supreme crisis yet. Definitely not. I think there is something else which we need to be very much concerned with, and it's it's contained in the statement which you mentioned by the Iraqi uh, Qatayi Hezbollah organization of training or bringing 12,000 fighters uh, into Jordan. Um, I don't think that's going to happen uh, tomorrow morning or anytime soon, really, for the same reason uh, that I answered the first question, which is that Jordanian security structures, when it comes to overt visible threats like that, are still pretty strong. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't a real concern. The thing which I'm very much concerned about, and which I've also written about uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, is the issue of smuggling of weaponry via Jordan from Syria into the West Bank. There have already been a number of cases of this which have now been widely reported. The first one that we came across was um, back in April of last year, if you remember. And it was reported that, I think, close to Stot uh, on the border there in the Jordan Valley, uh, certain types of weaponry had been discovered coming in. We now know what that was, unusual type of weaponry, I think the statement in the media here in Israel was at that time. We now know what those were, what that was. It was explosively formed penetrators, IEDs, for use as IEDs coming into the West Bank. And we now know that uh, a lot more of that stuff has come in. And when I read about that, my immediate conclusion, before I had proof, now I have proof because I looked into it, but my immediate conclusion was, yeah, that stuff must be coming in from Syria because it couldn't be coming any other way. It's not coming in all the way from Iraq. So the only way we can get it is from, from Syria, down from Syria into Jordan and then into the West Bank. And we now know that there are uh, extensive uh, smuggling routes that are coming that way with the participation of, well, we know who, once you get into Syria, you know, with the partition, but participation of Bedouin tribes, in that area who have been smuggling across those borders in that area for, you know, since time immemorial, with, with their participation, with the participation of Syrian customs officials, with the participation of Syrian uh, military personnel, also of Lebanese Hezbollah personnel who are very active, of course, in southwest Syria, and, and also uh, personnel of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps itself. As we know well, there is a contiguous supply line that the Iranians maintain all the way from the Iraq-Iran border, through Iraq, through the Abu Kamal border crossing into Syria, and then all the way on to Lebanon and the Mediterranean Sea, or the border with Israel, or in this case, as we see, the border with Jordan, and then through the border with Jordan, into Jordan, and then into the West Bank. So this is, this is something very, very significant indeed. It means that Jordan, Jordanian sovereignty is essentially being uh, being compromised and Jordan is accepting or, or is living with a situation in which weaponry is passing through Jordanian territory into the West Bank and it's not doing sufficient, uh, it's not acting sufficiently to prevent this. And this is very significant indeed because it means, you know, we know very well what the Iranians and, the, and their allies want for the West Bank. What they want in the West Bank is insurgency. Their ambition for the West Bank is armed Arab Muslim insurgency uh, in the West Bank, including, of course, Palestinians, but as far as they say, also Arab Muslims from other parts of the region. That's what they're building towards. So it would be very much uh, to our benefit to uh, be aware of that situation and to be acting very strongly in cooperation with the Jordanians, certainly in cooperation with the Americans and others, uh, to make sure that that pipeline of weaponry uh, is closed down uh, as soon as possible. Because as we know, you know, we've had something resembling an insurgency, or I would say an insurgency in the West Bank before, just, uh, you know, now nearly a quarter of a century ago, the Second Intifada is mistakenly usually referred to. Uh, but that insurgency, whilst it was, you know, a, a bloody affair in its own right, did not involve... Uh, the kind of weaponry which we're seeing come in now it did not involve the, the widespread use of IEDs, for example. We saw that in South Lebanon, but not in the West Bank. So their their goal is to have a much much more intense uh, military struggle in the West Bank, and they're busy 
carrying out the arming process of that right now. And we need to make sure that stops. And Jordan uh, is a key uh, node, so to speak, along that uh, route. And that has to be changed, I think. Really, it's very frightening. Um, can I, I, there's a ton of questions in the queue and I have a number of mine still that I haven't gotten to, but I do want to, before I turn to the audience questions, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, Iran, Russia, and China, that access as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's various weapons that are being exchanged between Russia and Iran um, as that relationship seems to have grown since the Ukraine war. And China has helped Iran thwart U.S. sanctions over the years yes. and um, became a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in July of 2023. So can you touch on what you think this means for Israel's ability, um, first of all, to continue its maneuvers in, in Syria, which seemingly Russia is allowing to continue despite the IRGC presence there? And, um, you know, where do you see Russia and China if attacks on Iran were to begin or or, or the war, this, this cold war between, or it's not even a cold war, this war between Israel and Iran and the West were to escalate? Yes, well, I do think that the relationship between uh, Russia and Iran has has changed as a result of the Ukraine war. And it's changed in the sense of the sort of balance of power between the two, uh, in the sense that prior to uh, the war in Ukraine, there was very much the sense that, you know, Iran was without any question the junior partner. Uh, Iran was the one which benefited from the relationship. In a way, it was more like a kind of client and the Russians were the patron. And now there's a little bit more uh, equality in the relationship in the sense that certain items of Iranian uh, technology have proven to be enormously useful to the Russians, specifically, of course, the drones, the Shahid uh, 136 uh, drone system, which now we are told they've even the Iranians have set up a, a factory on Russian soil producing. That you know proved to be a very, very useful piece of weaponry for the Russians. It's not a particularly uh, sophisticated uh, system, so I'm told, but if you just want to throw it at civilian uh, areas, which is what the Russians wanted to do, then it's pretty useful. So you know, the Iranians have made themselves profoundly useful to the Russians at a time when the Russians needed help. I think that's something which has sort of set the relationship on a, a very firm footing uh, looking ahead. With regard to what the Russians can provide the Iranians in return, there's been a lot of talk, as I think you're aware of, of air air systems, the SU-35, the Sukhoi, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm less uh, excited about that. I mean, I think, you know, or, or worried about that. Uh, you know, those systems don't come close to being able to challenge uh, the American uh, air systems, which Israel or the or America obviously would be putting in the sky in the event of a confrontation. So, you know, the notion of sort of Iranian fighter pilots coming out, this is not uh, so serious. But when it comes to uh, air defense systems, then for sure, you know, if the if the Russians put an S-300 there in uh, Iran, that will then deeply complicate the life of anybody who's thinking about, for example, trying to hit a, this or that Iranian uh, nuclear facility should that become necessary. So I do think it's a profoundly important strategic relationship underway now between uh, Russia and Iran. And I do think it changes uh, it changes a little bit the, the whole balance of the way we should be, be thinking about this stuff. I am of the opinion that uh, there is an emergent global anti-Western uh, axis with Russia and Iran as key components. I think we are entering uh, a historic period in, w in which, by the way, which, which none of us, unless people, somebody's listening who's kind of over 80 years old, I guess, but certainly neither of us have lived through anything like this, like a, a time when you know, the Western world is under a very, very profound uh, strategic threat. Of course, there was the, the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union and so on. But my sense is this is a very different period in the sense that, uh, you know, these are powers actively seeking to move forward and challenge the West and push forward and uh, make gains at the West's expense. They perceive the West to be extremely weak. And whilst the Cold War, of course, was, the, I mean, the Cold War, which we all know about, was a profoundly uh, serious and worrying time. In retrospect, we know that actually it was the time of America's greatest strength. You know, America arguably was never stronger than in the period after 1945 and up until 1989 when it won that Cold War. So, so clearly today, I think our enemies and maybe also ourselves also are aware that the Western world is not maybe necessarily so obviously powerful and strong and united as it may have seemed in the late 1940s, for example. So there's a real challenge underway. You mentioned the Chinese. China is, is of course, the most uh, consequential of anti-Western emergent 
uh, emergent powers and challenges. Uh, certainly, as far as our Middle East goes, a couple of things to bear in mind. The Chinese up until now have been keen to use economic muscle in order to promote their objectives in the Middle East. And I think that you mentioned the issue of uh, oil purchases from Iran, and that's up until now been the most consequential act of theirs. In essence, we discussed maximum pressure at the beginning. Uh, in essence, uh, the Iranians were able to ride out maximum pressure during the Trump presidency, not least because the Chinese just carried on buying oil from them. So they had a, a sort of safety net of oil per, of oil sales. So things were never going to get all that bad. That was a very important strategic move. And the Chinese didn't do it by statements or by military aid. They did it just by economic uh, action. And that's the kind of thing which I think we've seen them do elsewhere. You know, we know famously that they build ports and they build infrastructure. And these are all just for private uh, companies, except that in China, there, there isn't really anything such thing as a private company not connected to the state. The Chinese have a notion of the fusion of civil and military uh, activities and capacities. So they're slowly building up strength in that regard. But I would say that the Gaza war represents something of a watershed also in that in for this uh, for this process, because China has been more vociferous in its condemnations of Israel and less willing to condemn Israel's enemies in this round of fighting, the current war, than at any time in the past. It hasn't been seeking to sort of obfuscate and fudge and not be clear. It's been very clear and sometimes even shockingly clear uh, in its uh, sympathies and support for uh, for Hamas and for for the side of Israel's enemies. So yes, I think there is this coming to this slow coming together. We shouldn't exaggerate the uh, cohesiveness of it yet. It's not yet fully crystallized. But I think anybody sort of looking at the the runes, so to speak, looking at the the, the, the discernible direction of events, will say that yes, there is a coming together. There is an emergent global anti-Western. Axis and the Middle East component of that is going to be the Islamic Republic of Iran and its allies. They are going to find their way to this emergent uh, anti-Western power axis uh, currently coming into being. Thank, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to ask you my last question because in the queue, a number of a lot of people have asked this, and it goes to um, something that you you had concluded in your report. And you said, the situation calls for the United States and its allies, especially those in the Middle East, to work together to end the 45 year regime of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, so, you know, people want to know how that's that's gonna happen. How are we gonna go about doing that? Is, is regime change something realistic? And at a Mideast Forum luncheon on Friday, I met with the Iranian opposition leader, Bahid um, Beheshti, who, mm. I know also spent a day on, on the Hill talking about these the urgent need for Iranian regime change. He was very clear that that um, the Americans and their allies, once they hit the re Iranian regime, if, if they do that, the people of Iran will rise and finish the job. That's a, a quote that he said. Um, given the, wh what do you know about the ability for the Iranian people or outside Western influences to Im impact a possible regime change? Um, is that something that that is realistic? And if not, is, uh, is is a military alternative something that you see actually happening? That bunch of audience questions all kind of put together. Yeah. First of all, with regard to how realistic uh, it is, I, I was just last week was in uh, in northern Iraq and I met with a number of uh, Iranian friends there, people who I speak to regularly, including people who are resident in Iran and who were, you know, spending time in northern Iraq before going back again. And I was once again struck by the uh, sense, which I, I constantly have, of the considerable fragility and unpopularity of the regime in Iran. You know, there is ample evidence, you know, coming out on a daily basis in, in a huge number of outlets uh, to show that this regime is not popular, that this regime uh, is uh, is much more fragile than it makes itself out to be. A friend of mine said to me that she thought, an Iranian friend said to me that she thought probably around 15% of the population is firmly behind the regime and would fight for it. So, you know, I think there's an enormous cynicism and skepticism towards the regime. It's a regime that has impoverished Iran. I would uh, note also that its management of Iran's resources, such as water and natural resources, has been you know, shockingly incompetent. The other thing which I hear again and again from Iranian friends is, you know, don't be thinking that even that 15% of people are all kind of ideological zealots. 
many of the people who are close to the regime now are close to it because of money, because as the result of their closeness to the regime, they get to have money and have good lives. But they're not necessarily people who are fanatically committed, you know, to the ideology of the regime. And that's a very different thing, I think, as well, and something we should always be bearing in mind. Let us remember that the regime in just the last uh, half decade, you know, has faced two rounds of very determined demonstrations against it. First of all, the more economically motivated demonstrations in 2019, just prior to the uh, uh, pandemic. And then, uh, of course, just a couple of years ago, the uh, women life freedom uh, demonstrations uh, following the killing of Mahzajina uh, Amini for the supposed uh, improper wearing of her hijab, a compulsory uh, head dress in Iran. So, you know, it's already been to the last half decade, two very large rounds of demonstrations. There's ample evidence that the people of Iran do not uh, want to be living under this uh, system. There's a very young generation. It's a young country of people who, from what everything which the evidence we see are hostile, not only to the ideology of Islamic Republic of Iran, but many of them even to Islam itself. Iran is not an Arab country, I would remind uh, all of us. It's a country that had a vast and illustrious and rich history prior to Islam, full of cultural uh, riches, which Iranians are justifiably extremely proud of. So I think put all that together, yeah, I don't think there's a pre-revolutionary situation in Iran right now. There isn't. But do I think there's what to work for and what to work with? The answer is absolutely yes. I think that if we as uh, countries and societies, I mean, Israel, United States and its allies were to make our objective, the bringing down of the Islamic Republic of Iran regime, then there are plenty of people to work with. There are plenty of people willing to work uh, to, towards that goal. And there's lots and lots of work to do. And it should be a strategic uh, goal of ours. Let me just conclude this by saying the following. You know, we began by talking about Iran's proxies in the Arabic speaking world. Uh, as people who know my work will know, you know I regard the Iranian uh, capacity, the IRGC's capacity for building and working proxies to be second to none. They are, they are without peer in the Middle East, in that specific area. And that's what's produced their successes again and again in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, among the Palestinians. But that's, in lots of ways, kind of all they're good at. You know, when it comes to the kind of full set of skills required for defending and advancing a system, uh, they don't have much else. That's what they have. Once you break through that, you break through into profound weakness in the case of Islamic Republic of Iran. So I would suggest that, yeah, we need to push forward and we will encounter that weakness and we'll keep on pushing until the Islamic Republic of Iran falls. Um, that's, that's great insight, Jonathan. Um, one thing about Iran that we a number of people are asking about because we haven't discussed it all is their nuclear capability and mm -hmm. the impact of that um, progression on the situation now with between this war, you know, between Iran and, and Israel. And we know you've discussed, you know, Hezbollah's purpose really is to protect that mm. ability to proceed with with the building of the nuclear weapon but if that if, if first of all i guess nobody knows what's going to be done to stop it but how is that going to change the calculus in the region if iran does obtain a nuclear weapon if iran uh, wishes to obtain a nuclear weapon at least this is what i'd know only from publicly available sources but if iran uh, wishes to obtain a, a nuclear weapon and to uh, to place uh, a warhead on a missile and then have a, you know, a workable nuclear device, uh, we would still have between six months and a year between their decision to do that and their uh, uh, achieving that capacity. Uh, I hope very much that our intelligence services are good enough uh, that we'll know if and when they've made that decision and begun that uh, effort. If our intelligence services are good enough, then I would hope very much that we, when I say we here, I mean Israel, will do whatever is necessary through military action to do whatever we can to degrade that possibility. Even if we can only set it back by a year or two years, whatever it is, I hope very much and believe that's what will then take place. My own sense, at least, is that the Iranians, the Iranians are now effectively a threshold nuclear state. That's to say, if it comes to the issue of just testing an atomic uh, device it's only a matter of weeks what will take longer for them would be to then put that you know effectively put that on a warhead so they are effectively a uh, a threshold nuclear power at this stage as i said if they 
choose to go for breakout, I hope we'll know and have time to act, and I hope we then will act. If, on the other hand, they don't right now choose to go for uh, breakout and they just remain a threshold nuclear power, then, you know, that adds, of course, to the concerns and to the dangerousness of the moment we're living in. But it doesn't mean that there will be military action immediately required, and I don't think military action will take place. So as my view has long been, that anything short of you know, rhetoric aside, and politicians love rhetoric, but, but anything short of a discernible decision by the Iranians to go for breakout uh, will not produce a, a military response from the West, not from uh, America, of, co of course, uh, not from Israel either. If that decision is taken, I hope we'll have time to do what's necessary. Uh, if we don't, and we end up with a nuclear run, you know, of, of course, a, a nightmare scenario, then we can just take everything we've already said uh, today and you know multiply it to the power of 10 in terms of the Iranian capacity for mischief and destruction and advance and uh, and power building across the region so you know that's a, that's a nightmare scenario but it's very possible as i said that i think they will not make that decision immediately that they'll be content to be a threshold power for a while and that therefore you know will continue not only to be observing the nuclear situation with vigilance as we must, but also dealing with these other areas of Iranian uh, power building uh, in the region, which we've been discussing. Well, so a good follow-up to, to that, and this is an excellent question that someone posed, is is Iran's strategy actually military or is it to destroy the economy and quality of life that will make people leave over time? In other words, you know, leaving Israel and abandoning the Zionist enterprise, whether through fear of a nuclear uh, weapon or, or otherwise? more October 7th threats and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a good question. And my answer is clear, and it is the latter. In other words, it's not a conventional military threat. It's not primarily that the Iranians want to, well, clearly it's not that they want to build up a conventional army and eventually sort of launch armored divisions across from Syria, let's say, because if they'd wanted to do that, we would have noticed they would have invested in building up an army of that kind, but they have not. They've not invested in conventional div armored divisions and conventional armed forces. They've not uh, invested in a conventional air force that you need to carry out anything like that. Not at all. They've invested in precisely the opposite of that. Ballistic missiles, the nuclear program, and of course, proxies, lightly armed, low intensity, uh, lightly armed forces made for low intensity combat, which all indicate that, yes, they are going for the latter option, as indeed they say very openly uh, many times, that what they want to do is to subject Israel to a kind of death by a thousand cuts, in which something like October 7th, you know, is it would be seen as an important watershed. They want to make life uh, impossible in Israel. They want to diplomatically isolate Israel, to subject Israelis to security vulnerability, to destroy the possibility of, of economically successful life in Israel. Yes, in order to uh, weaken the country demographically also, with the notion that the strong populations and the mobile populations will leave Israel and just a small population of people who aren't able to leave will be left. You know, I think with the notion that then somewhere down the line, that sort of weakened, isolated, demographically uh, depleted uh, state of Israel, you know, long since cut off from its American friends and long since cut off from its European connections, will then be kind of dealt a final uh, death blow for sure. Destruction finally is the goal, but the idea absolutely is a long and slow, a long war campaign, so to speak, to be conducted, excuse me, not only by military means, but also by economic pressure, by political pressure, by diplomatic pressure, by all available uh, means, military, conventional, and also uh, subconventional, in order to produce that weakening, which will eventually, they hope and believe, uh, produce Israel's demise. They are, by the way, let me add this, just to reiterate what I already said, they are much weaker than Israel. In other words, we should not be we should be paying careful attention, but we should not be overly impressed by the rhetorical game of Iran. It's not Israeli society that's weak. It's the Islamic Republic society that's weak. It's not Israelis who are not loyal to their army and their state and their and their citizenship. It's Iranians who are not. Of course, Iranians are loyal to Iranian national identity, but in their large numbers, they're not loyal to the Islamic Republic and to its uh, Islamist ideas, which are not Iranian ideas, not ideas shared by the bulk of population. So yeah, they their ideologues like to tell themselves how weak and vulnerable we are. Actually, it's them who are weak and vulnerable and full of... Uh, full of uh, potentially uh, vulnerable uh, spaces which we can uh, exploit should we choose to do so.
I think that's a great way to end this webinar. It's a, that's a that's a positive way to end end the webinar. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, I thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to all of the questions. There were a lot of them. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, perhaps we, I can follow up with Jonathan uh, if you have any other further questions to, to ask. Um, again, thank you all for joining, Jonathan. Appreciate the time and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, Lori. Bye-bye.